The labor of our heroes past shall never be in vain. That is certainly a message that President Mohamedou Buhari picked up on as he declared June 12th as a new Democracy Day here in Nigeria. Now, of course, Democracy Day in Continuum is going to be going on all week. And today, joining us in the studio, we have the son of late Chief MKO Abiola, and that is no other than Abdul Abiola. And we're going to be looking into the life and the legacy of not only his father, but his mother as well, as Nigeria worked towards progress and democracy. Thank you so much for joining us today. How are you? Oh, I'm, I'm great. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you. I can imagine it's been a busy, busy, busy couple of days. Uh, it's hectic. It's <laughs> okay, so let's start off with a recap of yesterday's activities. I understand a lot was going on at your father's house. Oh, yes, yes, yes. But, like, obviously, it didn't start out at my father's house, actually. Um, I had to represent the family in Ogum State. So I woke up about 4.30, you know, jetted out. And I got there exactly at 7 when it was time for the... Um, for the um, walk, we had like a four kilometer walk, and then we capped it off um, at my father's ancestral home, where I just quickly had to just like hustle a speech out and then went straight to Lagos for the unveiling of the statue. Amazing, but, yeah. amazing. Now, what was it like growing up in the house of someone who was so loved and so respected by many? Oh, well, first of all, it was amazing, you know, you, like, I, one of my uh, first memories were, like, even, like, normally when you try to go to school, you know, I, nobody I knew ever had to beg people to excuse them just so you could pass. Like, there were so many people in the house, and, you know, it was so, and really, I really didn't really know, like, because my dad was so busy, it wasn't like he was there all the time, but my mom happened to be more like a father and mother figure because of my dad's you know, being so busy. I do want to focus a lot on your mother in this interview. We are going to get there, but before we do, what do you have any, what would you say are your key memories leading up to the 12th of June, 1993? Oh, well, there, there, there are like several, but like the, the, this, there's one that I remember where I get like a uniform, like mm -hmm. a security uniform, because I knew I always wanted to be in the, at the gate because you know, it seemed like that was like the best job ever because you get to see everybody yeah. that comes. <laughs> you know, why wouldn't anybody want to be at the gate? Yeah. So um, my dad got me a uniform. So then I, used, I now became the sergeant and I was only about six. So that was one of the f memories I have of my dad. And then this, some of the other ones were like, you know, I think when uh, the soldiers were looking for my father, you know, and then they came into my room searching my wardrobe. Seeing if my father, my father was a big dude. I, I don't think it could fit in the wardrobe. Yeah. <laughs> but they still opened it and then they put the gun in the shirt. And like, you didn't have to go that but far. But that must have been terrifying for you. Well, actually, I knew that um, I knew that my father was trying to make a difference. Yeah. And you know, when when you're trying to make a difference, people always like to be in status quo. They don't like yeah. change. So when you do try to make change, you, you you're about to get some pushback. And that actually leads me to ask about the direct and also indirect influences that the events of June 12th, 1993 have had on your family. Oh, well, first of all, like, like I mentioned, um, you know, and I know you, you said you were going to bring us back to my mom, but yeah. like I mentioned, um, I was, you know, um, I was really hurt by the whole scenario because my mom was actually taken away from me during that time. Yeah. You know, I had to actually be smuggled out of the country. So it wasn't, it wasn't actually only me, it was me and my younger brother. We're the only two, my mother's still around. And we, uh, we had to be smuggled out by uh, one of my uncles. And he got us throughout to Kutonu. And then we from there went to London, we went to America. And we were with my brothers and it was like, I was my brothers and sisters and we were like seven of us in one bedroom apartment. And this is coming from like a 20 room uh, mansion in Lagos. We had, a, supposedly yeah. had some other properties all over like the world. And then I'm like, we're now stuck in one bedroom with like seven people. And we're not used to it because yeah. we were always, we were like, our builders were very independent people and we all doing our own thing in yeah. our own different way. And so, every child had their room, their yeah, own. Yeah, you know. have your own space. Yeah. And then, you know, you know, like huddle together. But, you know, based on, I think, the way we were brought up by my mom, um, we were able to like really, you know, mm -hmm. stick in, to each other and we supported each other. Like basically all seven of us just leaned on each other until we all grew up, and yeah. I'm really excited about that. And if I'm correct, you actually weren't around. You were in the United States when your father was killed. Yes. And yes. you didn't find out for a couple months, right? Oh, well, I, like, leaving um, Nigeria in that scenario, I was already pissed off. So going to America, and then, you know, in America, the teachers are not allowed to beat the students. You call your teachers by your first name. So it was only natural that I started to rebel. And in rebelling, you know, my sisters thought at the time when my, when my dad had passed that, if that I was told at the time, I could have, you know, 
they had a little bit upset and then might have done something I would regret. So they waited a couple, I think about a month and a half before they told me. Amazing. Well, not amazing, but I mean, wow, yeah. like that, that is quite a stretch, you know? Yeah. Right. Now, let's go back to your mother, Mrs. Kodi Biola, because she played a significant role in Nigeria's democratic process, of course. And I think it's an important discussion for us to have, because uh, I want us to speak about female participation in democracy and politics. Give us a greater insight into the kind of person that your mother was and the woman that you knew as mummy, mom, uh, that we know as Mrs. Kodi Rats Abiola. Well, like, I think she just, she's just like her husband, because they were very generous. She was very humble. And... You know, one of the like first memories I have of her was, you know, going to school in the 504. And we had like 15 limousines in the house, two helicopters in the field, you know, Mercedes Benz, you know, like different cars. But the one 504 was the one that was going to take me to school. And I think I that's to... my earliest car memory yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering, like, wait, seriously, Ma, like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm a Biola, which I think she was trying to let me know that people outside but not everybody had money, and you shouldn't always think money was the, was everything. And you know, she was trying to teach me that, and, and and I think it was really important because even after when I lost her and everything, you know, it was some kind of comfort in that you know early memory of knowing that okay, well, my mom was trying to show me that like you know what, sometimes things do change, and you should be able to adapt because you know you don't adapt and you're just gonna fall. So yeah, so that was that for her, and for like women in politics, like I said, you know, they said. You know, you, you you give a woman something. You know, you basically take care of the family. They, the woman at the bone, at the backbone of our society. You you can't, you know, you know, try to keep them. You know, you, you can't try to like control a woman. It, it, it's like a it's like a future effort. You're just wasting your time. You know, um, like I'll give you an example. Um, my dad, you know, really had a passion for the Nigerian people, especially yeah. the masses. He, he had a problem with people suffering. He thought the country could do better and could do better for its people, which I agree with. Uh, so. When he he was he was really close with my mom, so he used to confide in my mom, and you know he used to always cry about like the p problems and why you know things just keep going wrong because he said he based it on leadership. So he asked my mom if we should run, and my mother said, you know what, you go ahead and run, mm. because she knew that his vision and his conviction he wasn't gonna let it go. And it, and like you know it's one thing to look back and have regrets, and it's another thing to do what you want to do. So she supported him, and when he was put in, um, when he was arrested, you know, um, she started fighting. I was actually there with her. Sometimes I'll go to school, come back, she'll be uh, locked up in jail for a couple of days. And the last time she happened to have been shot. But what I wanted to say to women out there is, the power is in them. Like, nobody's gonna tell a woman what to do. Like, it, I'm like, for me, I grew up with my sisters, and if you know my sisters, half sad, Kefila Moram, mm. they're so strong that, you know, I laugh sometimes and yeah. say, like, my, my dad used to always say to them, like, the, the man that will marry his daughters. So I'm, the, I'm very open, and I, and I believe that women do have a role to play in government and in basic society. Definitely. And uh, according to global standards, government shouldn't have less than a 35% representation of women within the government. And of course, we don't have that in Nigeria today. What key steps do we need to start looking at as women, myself and other women out there, with regards to civic engagement and making sure we are at the forefront? Well, you know what, I, I think that, you know, based on the way we practice politics, in this country, it's you know it's very you know it's very negative. It's like especially for in a, from a woman's point of view, you know it's so rowdy. You know sometimes you know you think that it doesn't have to be like this. You know, I think the, I think it's actually purposely made that way to actually like deter women. But like I said, you know they said they like they do different ways to skin a cat. You know, so you don't necessarily have to go the rumble way that other politicians do. So instead of doing the big rallies, you can just have like your message sent through, mm. your text or stuff. So but like I said. Um, I believe that you know when you get like some organization telling you the percentage you should put into something, you might as well just ignore that. Why not 50-50? Or why not 60-40-40? Because I think women do outnumber men. These are the men. questions I ask. You know, Look at Rwanda, you yeah, know? Yeah, women Canada. do outnumber men. So if we're talking about like, you know, share percentage, why don't we do it like that if it's a really a democracy? But like I said, we're just going to be bogged down in this conversation. What okay, side women? note. Would you describe yourself as a feminist? Oh, well, see, like, what, like when people ask questions like that, you know, it's like you're putting yourself in a box. Mm. I would say this. I wouldn't, you know, I think what women all around the world would want is just being able to speak and be heard. And what I would, be, what I would always champion is, you know, the woman's right to be heard and to speak and, you know, to vote and to be voted for. And to, you know... Just the basic equality just the, of opportunity. Just, just exactly what a man can do. 
why not for women? Yeah. I completely agree with you on that front. Now, we've looked into the importance of June 12th and recognizing June 12th as Democracy Day. How can we now leverage on this historical change to ensure that the labors of our heroes past shall never be in vain? Oh, it's very simple. We just get to get involved. I think that's the most important thing. I think, you know, participation is nine tenths of it. Like, once you participate, you get to know more. And then, you know, once you get that information, you start finding solutions, even without you even knowing you're looking for solutions. The solutions start to come because you're already thinking about the problem. Mm -hmm. So we, so now we have this. I believe you know the conversations have already started. People are now saying other things. They're saying, okay, well, this was what the junta was about. So we're having creative discussions. Mm -hmm. You know, talking about the unity that was fostered then. How can we recreate it now? And I think in a matter of time, we're gonna. We're going to be really pleased where we'll be going. Definitely. I completely agree with you. And at the end of the day, when it comes to democracy, we also need to put time in there as well as a factor. Would you say Nigeria is still a relatively new democracy? How would you rate our progress so well, far? Well, like I said, you know, I, I was in America for 17 years yeah. after the whole thing. And I saw the American democracy. And America is about like 200 and something years old right now. We're about like, what, 60? I think we're still toddlers. We're crawling. And that's fine because democracy is not solid. It doesn't stand still. It's always moving. And it's fluctuating. Before you know it, you're going to start saying, you know, now we have this not, not too young to one vote. I, I, I'm interested to see a lot of you coming out because, like we do, once you, you know, the younger we are, like the youth uh, have newer ideas, you know, fresh. You know, they like on Instagram and stuff. I can't even figure out Twitter. You know, I don't know if I'm or I'm a youth. If I can really consider myself youth, if I can't figure out Twitter, mm -hmm. so um, I just pray that um, you know, we as a people will like just use our words instead of our fists or weapons. Definitely, to maximize our potential. Yeah. Now, we do also know that in every society, of course, we have good eggs and we have bad eggs. But minimal enforcement of laws has unfortunately <coughs> led to situations where we are seeing the bad eggs in society thriving. And therefore, we may have poor leadership at the forefront of our polity and of our different services around, including security, etc. Now, with the 2019 elections coming up next year, what, uh, what should citizens currently be doing to be engaged and and also ensure that we are applying certain notions to keep the historical change in its place of June 12th. Okay, well, first of all, I'll, I'll go back to this. Uh, 1993, when it was actually annulled, mm. it was, you know, people, like the powers that be at the time saw the people rise up and say, we have a voice and we're going to be heard. And then they were, that voice was taken away from them. So that was hope taken away from them. So it was like they took their voice away. Mm. And what Buhari has just done is he's given the people back their voice. So... It's very simple to me. Your, your vote will, will count. So just vote for who, in your heart, you believe would do you right. And, 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 and besides that, like, I, I, I can stand you. We can sit here all we want and, you know, say, oh, this is what we should do. There, there's, no, there's, no master, there's no master plan. You know, nobody has all the ideas. The, the only way we're going to move, come out of where we are and even deepen our democracy is by just having these conversations. Mm -hmm. And would you say that corruption is the root to every problem that we're seeing in Nigeria well, today? Well, you see, like I said, you know, when, you see, once somebody does something like my father had done, not to mention the millions of people who also died during that time, it was very important that women, yeah. old women, you know, soldiers, police, people who were brutalized, you know, businesses were destroyed, you know. So, like, now that people who do the right thing are now publicly honored, you see, it's very hard for somebody to do something knowing that, look, they, I'm going to be a pariah. You know, my father was sacrificed a lot because he was not doing it for himself. He was doing it for me and my kids. Because he knew, he said, look, at the way we were going, we we're going to implode. So, like I said, now that this has been done, the, the, this, my, kid, my kid on this uh, would now know, you know, he would know that, look, I can stand my ground, I can be, I have my convictions, and I can, you know, I can pay the supreme sacrifice because I know that my people would honor me when I'm dead. This is 25 years we're talking about. Mm. Now, people, you know, go to have these different medicines they take so they don't fall ill and they don't want to, nobody wants to die. But my father's been dead for 25 years, but we're talking about him. So I guess it's by what you do while you're alive. And that will actually translate to what happens when you die. Because people sometimes just die like two days ago and people are even just like, you know, just like, it's like a footnote. Yeah, I, I completely understand what you're saying. And unfortunately, what we're seeing in Nigeria today is ongoing killings, incessant killings, innocent lives being lost, and a lot of things that we shouldn't be experiencing in a democratic country. Now, what are the challenges that are really posed to us right now? What challenges do we need to look at and say, these are things that we need to end and end uh, now yeah. in order for us to ensure that the labors of our heroes pass are really not in vain? Okay, first of all... Um 
with the issues of the killings, like I know that our, our president, um, General Mohamed Abari, um, well, Mr. Mohamed Abari, is actually doing the best he can, and he's working hard on that. But we have to also understand that, you know, with this global warming of a thing, mm. our like you know our reserves, like water reserves are deplete. And so, what I would think the first thing step will be to do this ranching. You know, these things have happened in other climate, other other countries. So what we just have to do is just do some research, you know, and educate our people. You know, just because some, like I said, people do not like change. Now, somebody that's been walking across the country for so long, you know, doesn't want to stop it because, but if we can do something where we just inform them that, well, these are the reasons why we're doing this. You know, I think with more information and more um, engagement with, the, um, with all stakeholders, things will get better. And like I yeah. said, with what, what has happened, you know, the conversation wouldn't be, you know, if it's me against you. We're not trying to, we're, we're pushing a unity or a Nigeria first approach now. So if we're doing that, then I think the most important thing is we shouldn't, you know, like we should say, okay, fine, this cannot continue the way it is because people are dying and that's wrong. So what we can do is we find solutions. And ranching to me is like just one of the best. Yeah. And with that, you can now like try to get, get them educated because like I said, with more education, people will start to see more avenues to creating wealth. And lack of education is really one of the stumbling blocks that we're facing. You know, when people say, oh, we need light, give us light and we'll be okay. You know, like well, somebody, somebody who who is an illiterate with lights is is, is, is an illiterate with, yeah. with light. You know, it's, it's not going to change anything. But with education, you know, what I mean, you can actually figure something out that you would actually even get your own generator to put lights. Yeah. So I think we should focus more on education, education. It education. is the bedrock of society it at is. the end of the day. But one thing, Abdul, that's missing from our education system. Well, there are a lot of things, but one thing in particular is voters' education and political education. It's not necessarily in our secondary school curriculums. And unfortunately, we're seeing the ripple effects today. A governor can come out and give you a rice bag, and you're going to take that rice bag and give him your votes because that is food for your family for the next month, and he has just done something to help your life. And we are seeing this going on, and, vote, and poor voters' education is leading to bad decision-making. Less than 30 million citizens voted in the 2015 elections. Why is it important, especially for youths and women in particular who are sidelined, to go out and get one's PVC? Well, first of all, you know, you're, you, like, as a citizen of the country, you know, that right to vote is your voice to decide the direction of the country. Now, no matter where your divide is, you know, you could be on any side of the divide, this is supposed to be a bipartisan issue. You should go and vote. You know, you can vote for, you know, you can vote for anybody. It's your choice. And I think since you have that choice, it's only right that you make that, you, you do that. Because, you know, what we, what the decisions we make today will tell you your future tomorrow. So, like, it's very important that we, um, we foster that um, engagement um, and that mentality of, mm -hmm. you know, ownership of our country. When we vote, you've put your stamp on the country for the next four years. So let's, you, I, I, would, I would encourage you to take the rice, take the money, take the rice, take the money, but do what you want to do. Because if they're offering you rice, Jamu, <laughs> because I don't know why you, my jam, my, even, me, even me, I'll take the rice. So take the rice, but do the right thing. Okay, definitely. That is a message we want to send across. Do the right thing. Now, I'm young. I'm a youth. I don't necessarily have 1993 memories, but my parents made sure that I knew about the life and the times of people like your father and what they fought for and stood for. Now, yesterday on radio, I was listening into discussions, and one thing I picked up on is that in the times of your father, ethnic divides in terms of the polity were non-existent, or at least close enough to non-existent. But in today's Nigeria, we are seeing that cultural and ethnic bias is giving us a more isolated feel from one another in different geographical zones. Now... How do we come out of that? How do we come back to the times of when your father was in the polity and we weren't seeing these things? I go back to it. Like back then, you know, like you know, things were actually working. You know, you have to be very careful with this. Things were working, and then with the annulment of that election, you know, it sent a, a, a signal to everybody in the country. Like, look, if you really have something in between your head, get out. So, what do you expect when our thinkers, our leading minds? in other countries, making that, those countries better. You only have like, you're the bottom of the barrel to pick from. But what I do know from, you know, from you know, recent activities is that more people, more brilliant, young, energetic people are coming into the fray. 
And like I said, it's only a matter of time before these, before you know things will start to change. But we have to first take that first step. And thank God for the president again for this not too young to run vote, because if we're looking for any form of encouragement, we just got it. I completely agree with you on that. Now, last but not least, before we do round up, 25 years on, let's look at the future. <coughs> Where do you see Nigeria 25 years from now? Oh, well, it's, it's that, um, you know I mean, I can look in a crystal ball. Nobody can really tell. But as, uh, as of now, I believe our democracy was stronger than it was yesterday. And that's something that I didn't think I was going to say. So, and that's a good thing. You know what I mean? You know, people happy. And you know, people actually optimistic. Uh, let's just capitalize on that. Do the right thing. You know, you get a contract, do the contract. You yeah. know? Well, thank you so much for being here with us on the show today, sharing your story and giving us a greater insight into the life and times of an amazing man being your father, Chief MKO Abiola. The 12th of June is our new Democracy Day, ladies and gentlemen. And we've been speaking to Abdul Abiola. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. So what are you doing for the rest of the day? What other activities are going oh, on? Oh, well, I have a couple um, other engagements to go for. And... Democracy Day and continue. Yeah, and continue. <laughs> then I'm going to have to figure out what I'm supposed to do with this. Yeah, I was actually going to ask before we do round up, what is it? Oh, actually, um, yesterday at the end of the program, I got a, an award. And it says, Are Akikoju Odua. And it's like supposed to be some kind of chieftaincy award. So, so we need to congratulate you, yeah. Chief. <laughs> Thank you. We need to congratulate Thank you. So you. congratulations yeah. to Chief Abdul Abiola as well on this award. That's amazing. Yeah, thank you. That is amazing. To enjoy more of this, our Ugonke videos when you just watch, press this button to subscribe on top of our YouTube page. You go love her.